Oh, goodness. So, how are you finding Australia so far? Oh, great. I think, I think uh, there's a lot of energy, vitality, a lot of young voices uh, waiting to be heard. I think uh, Australia is poised to leap into greatness. To leap into greatness. You mean we're not already great? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's coming very soon. But, but there is a challenge that we're facing. <laughs> there, there is a challenge that we're facing in Australia, which is that uh, not everyone believes that science is uh, maybe the principal thing that we should be funding. I mean, what do you think about that and the current, current state of affairs here? Well, let me be blunt. Science is the engine of prosperity. You can ignore science as much as you want. You will just be poor. <laughs> Look at those nations of the world that say, science, bah, we want ideology. We want uh, certain kinds of, of forms of religion that are hostile to science. Look at those nations. They are poor. Nations which embrace science and technology become rich. The only problem is that the nations that forget this are the rich nations. They forget why they're rich. However, there are some hungry nations out there, China, India, you don't have to tell them twice that science is their meal ticket. You don't have to talk to a young Chinese or a young Indian engineer that science is the way for them to develop, for them to become great and prosperous. You don't have to tell them that. And just remember that if you don't embrace science, they will. Well, that sounds like a, a rather dire warning. You, you've taken us through the past few hundred years and the awesome developments that, that physics has given us. What about the next, let's say, 50 years? What can the people in this room hope to see in their lifetimes that will really revolutionize the way we live? Well, the first wave was steam power. The second wave was electricity and magnetism. The third wave was high technology and transistors and lasers. The fourth wave, the fourth wave is at the molecular level. We're talking about nanotechnology, creating atomic machines. We're talking about biotechnology, manipulating the genes which make life possible. And third, artificial intelligence. All of them at the molecular level. That's going to be the engine of the 21st century. I think some would ask the question, why hasn't artificial intelligence got further by now? It seems to be the kind of thing that people have been you know, uh, prophesying for a long time, and yet, to me, a computer doesn't really seem in any way sentient. Well, you realize that um, we scientists underestimated the sophistication of the human brain. Sitting on your shoulders is the most complex object in the known universe. If you were to take a computer that would model the human brain, that computer would be the size of a city block one city block of solid computers, it would be cooled down by a river, and it would need a nuclear power plant to energize. But your brain does it with 20 watts. So when someone calls you a dim bulb, be proud. <laughs> be proud that you're a dim bulb. You have a dim bulb on your shoulders, and it is the most complicated thing in the known universe. And physics has allowed us to peer into the thinking brain. Realize that we've learned more about the brain because of physics, like MRI machines, in the last 10 years than in all of human history combined. We can actually see thoughts and blood flows moving in the human brain. And we can even prove or disprove old wives' tales that are thousands of years old. It's an old wives' tale, for example, that a man starts to act stupid talking to a pretty girl. <laughs> it's true. You can actually show that blood flow drains hang on, hang on. from the brain when a man sees a pretty girl and acts retarded. It's true. <laughs> Everyone always asks about hoverboards. So, so I guess I'll put the question to you. Where's my hoverboard? People ask the question, where's my jetpack? Where's my flying car? Where's my robot maid and butler? Well, let me ask you a simple question. Who's the one who prophesies that we're going to have flying cars and mechanical butlers? Cartoonists. Cartoonists were the ones who said we're going to have flying cars. Physicists never said that. <laughs> so, so what do you as a physicist say that we will have? 
Well, in the coming years, one thing that's going to hit the marketplace pretty hard is the fact that we're going to have the internet in your contact lens. You will blink and you will be online. And the first people to buy internet contact lenses will be college students taking final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and see all the answers to my exams right there in their contact lens. And when you see somebody, you'll see a biography next to their name. If they speak Chinese to you, your contact lens will translate Chinese into English, and you'll see subtitles. So at a cocktail party, when there's some very important people there, but you don't know who they are, in the future, you will always know who to suck up to at any cocktail <laughs> party. Do you not worry that this is just going to inundate these brains with too much information. I mean, already you hear about people suffering fatigue, of the data, of always checking their phone, of feeling stressed because of it. Do you not worry about those sorts of implications of these technologies? You know, those people have not discovered the off button. There is an off button, you know. You have the option of just hitting the off button and isolating yourself as much as you want. But you see, people want it. They want to be connected to their friends and finding out what's out there. So I think it's a matter of choice. People have chosen to be hyper-connected. But is this similar to saying, like, a, a, there's a heroin addict and you say, well, you can walk away, you know? Like, once you've given them the drug, is it possible to take it back? Like, might you ruin lives by doing this, creating this technology? But you see, being on the internet is not addictive. And I think, if anything, it is empowering. The people who have most to worry about the internet are dictatorships. Because dictatorships are being thrown out about once a year now because of Twitter. Who would have thought that Twitter would be the greatest force against dictatorships in the world today? And that means the internet spreads democracy. And here's the lesson. In the history of the world, no two major democracies have ever warred against another democracy. Democracies do not war against other democracies. Think of every war you had to memorize since you were in grade school, every single war. They've always been between kings, queens, dictators, monarchies, emperors, never between two major democracies. And so with the spreading of the internet, is the spreading of democracy, the kicking out of dictatorships, and the rise, I think, of a more peaceful world. What's not to love? Well, that is one of these, these big mysteries of the universe. I mean, one of the other big mysteries, I guess, is simply why we're here, why the universe uh, happened at all. And does string theory give us any new insights into that? Does it help us see, perhaps, what happened 13.8 billion years ago when the Big Bang occurred? Well, Einstein gives us a picture that the universe is a bubble. We live on the skin of the bubble. We're trapped like flies on flypaper. And the bubble is expanding. That's called the Big Bang Theory, which we see on CBS television every week. <laughs> now, as the universe expands, OK, we now believe that there could be other bubbles out there, other bubbles creating a multiverse of universes. And so we, know we don't longer believe in a universe. We believe in a multiverse of universes. And when these universes collide and create a bigger universe, or the universe splits and creates a baby universe, that's the Big Bang. So would it ever be able for us to determine whether this is really true? I think so. Just a few months ago, gravity waves were detected in the South Pole. We're talking about radiation from the instant of the Big Bang. In the future, we're going to have satellites which will take pictures of this gravity waves. And we're going to have baby pictures, baby pictures of the infant universe emerging from the womb. And maybe we'll see evidence of an umbilical cord, an umbilical cord in the infant universe detected by gravity wave detectors in outer space, connecting us to a parent universe. And this would be tremendous vindication for string theory. Well, that would be very interesting to see. And I hope we do see it in our lifetimes. Thinking about that vastness of space, do you think we'll ever be able to cross it as people? I mean, is, is, is inter, interstellar space travel in our future, do you think? Well, 
getting into outer space is quite difficult, first of all. People don't realize how expensive it is. If I take this, which weighs about a pound, and put it into orbit around the Earth, it costs about $10,000 to do that. That's your weight in gold. Think of your body made out of solid gold. That's what it costs to put you just in orbit around the Earth. To put you on the moon costs about $100,000 a pound. To put you on Mars is about a million dollars a pound. I'm just going to change this for the, the Australian audience. That's like $2.2 million per kilo. $2.2 million a kilo. Right. Yeah. That's your weight in diamonds. <laughs> okay. That's what it costs to put you on Mars. So you begin to realize how expensive outer space is, and then how distant the planets are, and the stars. The Saturn rocket, the rocket that took us to the moon, the Saturn rocket would have to operate for 100,000 years to reach Alpha Centauri, the nearest star. 100,000 years. We need a new method of space travel other than chemical rockets. So I think that in 100 years' time, we may have fusion rockets. Uh, these are called ramjet fusion rockets. They look like an ice cream cone. They scoop up hydrogen in the forward direction, fuse it in the back, so we have an infinite supply of fuel, hydrogen gas from outer space, energizing a fusion machine. That may take us to the stars in perhaps just a few hundred years. So we need something different, maybe antimatter engines, um, something different to get us closer to the stars rather than waiting 100 years. Now, you've, you've thought about ways of perhaps changing the, the, the sort of physical embodiment of us if we're to do this. Because obviously, if it's going to take hundreds of years, I mean, our regular bodies just wouldn't seem to work over that, that time Right. Scale. In my book, The Future of the Mind, which, by the way, uh, last, uh, last month, it hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list. Congratulations. Okay. Congratulations. And they, they used to think that books about science wouldn't sell. Is that right? Right. They used to say the word physics would never enter the New York Times bestseller list. And now you've had two of them, just you. I did it twice. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the, the point is, though, that in the future, we will have a disk called the connectome. We, right now, we will have a disk called the genome. That costs about $1,000. That is all genes, all the genes of your body on one disk. I've had my genes sequenced, most of them, by BBC television. In the future, we will have a second disk, and that disk is the connectome with all the memories, all the neural pathways of the human brain. And we will put this connectome on a laser beam, and we will send it into outer space. And the connectome contains all your memories, your personality, everything about you will be contained on the connectome. And to go to the moon will take about one second. We can shoot your consciousness to the moon in one second. To go to Mars would take about 20 minutes. 20 minutes to go to Mars, not, not thousands of years. And to hit Alpha Centauri, four years. Four years, you will visit another celestial body. So I think this is the neatest way to explore outer space. Forget booster rockets. Forget, uh, forget accidents. Forget weightlessness. Forget radiation. Light beams is the way to go. And maybe aliens in outer space have already done it. Maybe there's already an intergalactic space lanes of laser beams shooting consciousness throughout the galaxy, and we are too stupid to know it. When you talk about <laughs> time travel, yeah. realize that Einstein's theory of gravity does allow for time travel. In fact, his next door neighbor was Kurt Gödel, one of the greatest mathematicians of all time. In 1949, Kurt Gödel found the first time travel solution in Einstein's equations. If the universe rotates, if the universe rotates, and you rotate along the universe, you can return before you left. You can go backwards in time and return before you left, but going around the universe. The whole universe needs to be rotating? Or? That's right. Now, Einstein was deeply worried about this, and in his memoirs, in fact, I quote from his memoirs, Einstein says that I'm very worried about this, but you can dismiss it because of physical grounds. In other words, the universe expands, it doesn't rotate. 
If the universe rotated instead of expanding, time travel would be commonplace. That would be very strange. Right. Now we have black hole solutions of Einstein's equations. When you go through a black hole, mathematically, no one's ever done this, of course, but mathematically, if you go through a black hole, you wind up on a parallel universe. And if you go a second time, you wind up on another parallel universe. Each time you go through the black hole, you wind up on another parallel universe. But you end up also stretched so, so skinny you could never survive? Your, your consciousness could That's never That's for a small exist? black hole. Large black holes have very weak gravitational fields, and you can travel right through. A spinning black hole, for example, collapses to a ring, not a dot. The ring rotates very quickly. That's why it doesn't collapse, because of centrifugal force. If you were to fall through the ring, you will go right through to a parallel universe without being crushed to death. These are called the, the Kerr solutions of Einstein's equations. And so it's like the looking glass of Alice. The rim of the looking glass is the black hole. The center is the looking glass. And when you put your hand through the looking glass, your hand winds up on the other side of forever. That is the solution of Einstein's equations. So we just need to find a rotating black hole. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> now, now, to create one, of course, would require energy that is far beyond anything that we can harness today. So I think in perhaps hundreds, maybe thousands of years into the future, we just might have the ability to build a time machine. Well, but I it's not for us. It's not for us. What do you mean? It'll be for other people in other universes. Because we are very primitive. Uh, we physicists rank civilizations of the future, which are much more powerful than us. A type 1 civilization, for example, can play with planets. They control the weather. They can control earthquakes. That's type 1. A type 2 civilization can control a star, like Star Trek. The Federation of Planets will be a type 2 civilization. And then there's type 3 a galactic civilization like Star Wars. Now on this cosmic scale of type one, type two, type three, what are we? Type zero. We are type zero. <laughs> we get our energy from dead plants, oil and coal. But we are about 100 years from becoming type one. By the time you're type two, a few thousand years from now, you'll have enough energy perhaps to open a gateway through space and time. But now, it's not for us. What are the other big problems that you see the, the world facing in the next 50 to 100 years? Well, I said that in 100 years, we will become a type 1 civilization. We are privileged to be alive to see the greatest transition in the history of our civilization, the transition to type 1. However, we may not make it. Because the transition from type 0 to type 1 is the most dangerous of all transitions. Because a type 0 civilization like ours we just emerged from the swamp a few centuries ago. All the savagery of nationalism, sectarianism, fundamentalism is still with us. Just read the newspapers every day. It just jumps out at you. But we are marching toward a type one civilization. So I think there's hope. For example, uh, what is the internet? The internet is the first type one telephone system. That's all it is. We are privileged to be alive to witness the birth of the first major type one technology, the internet. What language will this type one civilization speak? Probably English. Congratulations, you already speak a language of type one. And look at the European Union, NAFTA, we're seeing the beginning of a type one economy. Look at the Olympics, uh, look at soccer, the beginning of a type one sports. Look at rock and roll, the beginning of a type one youth culture. And so we're already beginning to see the birth of a type one civilization, but as I mentioned, it's a dangerous transition because we have the proliferation of nuclear weapons into the most dangerous places on the planet Earth, like the Middle East, and also biogerms, weaponized germs. If you take the AIDS virus and weaponize it so it becomes airborne, you can kill 98% of the human population. Only 2% of the human population are immune to AIDS. 98% could die if you weaponize the AIDS virus. And so these are dangers that we face, plus global warming. <laughs> I like how you just threw that in at the end there. <laughs> and you've taken on this mission of finishing that manuscript that Einstein couldn't finish. How are we, how are we going? 
Are you, are you getting close to the end now? We think we have the theory, the theory of string theory. We don't yet quite have it in one inch form. Now, in 10 dimensions, a lower dimension, we have five string theories. They can be summarized by an equation one inch long. That's my equation. I wrote the string field theory, which allows you to summarize string theory into an equation one inch long. But now we have the 11th dimension, where we have membranes. We have beach balls and spheres and donuts. We don't yet have that in an equation one inch long. You know what's interesting about this is that most guys don't brag about how short it is. <laughs> if, if, you, if you know what I mean. But short is good. Short is good, right. Short, short is very elegant, right? Yeah. You know, if I was measuring in uh, English literary criticism, like what did Hemingway really mean by that passage, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Physics is the opposite. It gets shorter and shorter and more concise and more elegant and more beautiful. You can summarize all the equations of the known universe on one sheet of paper. One sheet of paper, every single physical theory known to science can be summarized in one sheet of paper. We want to get it down to one inch. That is a beautiful and elegant goal. Yeah. Well, I've had an amazing uh, chance to, to talk to you and ask you all the questions that I find particularly interesting over the last hour. Now I would like to open it up to everyone here. If you would like to ask Professor Kaku a question. <laughs> Dr. Kaku, you keep on talking about 11-dimensional hyperspace. A, how is that derived from such a simple theory on vibrating strings, and B, I like to think of why we can't see these other dimensions as like where someone looking at a lamp pole from a distance, we see it as being two-dimensional, but the ant on the lamp pole sees it as being three-dimensional. The ant can walk around it. But let's say I have my 11-dimensional lamp pole. It really is a lamp pole inside a lamp pole inside a lamp pole inside a lamp pole, etc. <laughs> that sounds it sounds very complicated. Can I ask how old you are? Um, eleven, turning twelve. You're eleven, turning twelve. Eleven. He. He, he could one day be solving some of the problems that you're dealing with. You were telling me you've got some some issues with the eleventh eleven dimensional theory. I should ask him. You could, you could use a hand. <laughs> yeah. uh, but let me quickly summarize. When I was a child, I would go to the tea garden in San Francisco, the Japanese tea garden, and I would watch the fish swimming just beneath the lily pads. And I asked a question that only a child would ask, and that is, what would the universe look like to a fish? And I realized that the universe was two-dimensional. The fish could swim forward, backward, left, right, but anyone who talked about the world of up, up into the third dimension was considered a crackpot and an idiot. But then I imagined a scientist fish living in that pond, and he would say, bah, humbug, there is no third dimension. There's only the pond. And then I imagined, as a child, reaching down and grabbing the scientist fish, lifting the scientist fish into the world of up. The scientists would see beings breathing without water, a new law of biology, moving without fins, a new law of physics. Well, today, we physicists believe, but we cannot prove, that we are the fish. We spend all our lives in three dimensions, moving forward, backward, left, right, up, down, thinking that that's all there is when actually the universe is expanding, perhaps, into hyperspace. At science museums, I sometimes see children saying, Mommy, Daddy, if the universe is expanding, what is it expanding into? And Mommy says, ask Daddy. <laughs> and Daddy says, ask Mommy. Well, if this picture is correct, the universe is expanding into another dimension. And that is the dimension of string theory. Right, and we you. are the fish. Yes. 
Professor Kaku, uh, you said that Australia is poised for greatness. How do we get there and how do we support Australian science to help us get there, considering the government has just cut $111 million from our premier scientific research institution and one in 10 CSIRO scientists are about to lose their jobs? You know, it's a free country and you can cut the science budget as much as you want, you're free to do that. You're also free to be poor because that's what cutting science does. You are eating your own seed corn. You are preventing new industries from being created. You see, politicians, I have nothing against politicians, but politicians are former lawyers. Lawyers see the world as a zero-sum game. You sue Peter to pay Paul. That's law. Sue Peter to pay Paul a zero-sum game. When a lawyer becomes a politician, they tax Peter to pay Paul a zero-sum game. So the pie gets cut thinner and thinner and thinner. Well, I'm a physicist. We believe in a bigger pie. Not just cutting the pie. We believe in making the pie bigger. For example, as I mentioned, two inventions from quantum physics changed everything, the transistor and the laser. Quantum physics gave two simple inventions that energized the world economy of today, but creating jobs, industries. How do citizens, though, uh, affect this change? If the politicians are making bad choices, how do the people of this country... You throw the politicians out. <laughs> well said. I think that is a brilliant note to end on. The future is a freight train. Either lie down in front of it or get on board. Right. So I want to thank you all for coming today. I want to thank Think Inc. for organizing this incredible event. Uh, those of you who are staying with us for the gala dinner, please stay back. Uh, for everyone else, it is good night, and I want you to uh, join me in thanking Professor Michio Kaku for a great evening. Yeah.